This episode of Interview with the Artist is brought to you by Stitcher. Stitcher is an award-winning free mobile app that lets you listen to all your favorite shows, including Interview with the Artist, plus discover the best of news, entertainment, sports, all on demand. With Stitcher, there's no downloading, no syncing, and no wasted memory. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the app stores. From WBAZ Radio, it's Interview with the Artist. I'm Walker Vreeland. It's Wednesday at 12 noon, and I'm getting ready to speak to Sandra Bernhardt. She's coming to town to perform her new one-woman show, I Love Being Me, Don't You. For the past two days, I've been watching YouTube videos of Sandra in the 80s, specifically her multiple appearances with her then-best friend and rumored lover, Madonna, on David Letterman. She hates it when people don't talk about her yeah. in front of her. Oh, Go ahead. you don't have that problem much. I'm just going to you. Woo! <laughs> Sandra. Uh, I love you, babe. Well, I can't believe you. As you can hear, Madonna always called her Sandra. Even Letterman called her Sandra. So I just assumed that was the correct pronunciation, and I phonetically spelled her name in my notes so I didn't call her Sandra. But when she called in, she said, Hi, this is Sandra. So before we began, we cleared this issue up. So it's Sandra. That's right. All right. <laughs> I want to get things right here. Good. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Sandra Bernhardt is a comedian, actress, and singer. As an actress, you've seen her on the big screen in Martin Scorsese's film The King of Comedy and on TV's Roseanne. Uh, She is a groundbreaking performer, a true star, and one of the sexiest women in show business, in my opinion. And we are so thrilled to have her here today. Sandra, thanks for joining us. Wow, what a great intro. (laughs) Thanks. So I, I have to just say right off the bat, what I love about you is not just that you're one of the funniest people out there. And your material is always fresh and relevant, um, but that it's all coming from a real place, uh, even when it's irreverent. I know that behind that, it's coming from uh, a foundation of, of honesty and, and authenticity. You you really tell it like it is. Thank you. That really, I, that, I'm very impressed that that you understand that and have that insight because it, it, it's really important to me that people know that. You know that it, this is not just something that that I do just to like while the, away the hours or to like make people uncomfortable it's really something that is very important to me and i always try to give people you know an honest portrayal of my life and, and how the world affects me you started as a stand-up and you became a staple at the comedy store in the 1970s was that the plan when you moved to la to become a stand-up or did you have other dreams as well you know i really wanted to be like kind of a hybrid between lily tomlin and that medler and you know, and add a bunch of other elements of, of performing into all of that. I didn't really have a clear-cut image of me being a stand-up, per se, and I don't really feel like I was, I ever really fit into the stand-up world as, as my only outlet, so, which is why I developed my singing and my writing and my acting, which I feel, you know, took me to a different place and kind of eventually got me out of that realm that really, I, I didn't really want to get stuck in it, to, to, to be honest. When did you know you wanted to be on stage? When I was five. Wow. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. I used to tell people when I was little, yeah, I'm going to be, a, you know, a, a comedian when I grow up. And people would laugh and think it was so cute. And... You said comedian? Yeah, I said comedian. Amazing. Uh-huh. <laughs> is that funny? So uh, your new show is called I Love Being Me, Don't You. Uh, tell me about the show. Well, it's a, it's a real, like, updated, postmodern super relevant contemporary vision of how I see the world, where I'm at professionally, um, privately, emotionally. You know, I kind of take you on a real journey, you know, and it it covers all the different aspects of my life and the things that, you know, really affect me and affect all of us. So I just like to, you know, really like give people a real wonderful ride and journey. How do you construct each one of your shows? How, do, you, do you work out material in the clubs? Do you have a writing partner? How do you work? No, I, I you know, I just tend to, um, I just tend to put music together and ideas and material and they all just sort of kind of meld together and it's really not, um, it's not done in the traditional way and I, I, I improvise a lot on stage. Even the night that I'm there, I'm sure that there'll be things that, you know, are really of the moment that I'll talk about that night and may never talk about again. I really try to keep it, you know, the, the improvisational part of it very, very relevant. And the set pieces, 
you know, I always try to add something new and keep them fresh as well. Well, you've always been very topical. Um, you, you've always had your finger on the pulse of the culture, um, and that's still the case. Uh, but how do you think you have changed as a performer over the years? Well, I've definitely become more confident. My work has, has grown and evolved. I think I know myself better. I think I'm calmer as a person in my day-to-day life, which, you know, of course affects what you're doing as an artist and a performer. So these things just tend to keep evolving in a really nice way if you're in touch with who you are um, in your life. And relationships, I've been, you know, with my girlfriend for almost 14 years. I, I, we have our, my, my 14 and a half year old daughter, which really grounds me and keeps me very real and connected. And these are all just important elements to, to, to continue to grow. You can't, you can't stall out as a performer. You've got to keep fresh and, and, and in the moment. You mentioned your daughter, and there's a track on your previous album, Everything Bad and Beautiful. Uh, I didn't see the show in person, but I have the album. And there's a track on that record that really, really touched me unexpectedly. Uh, yeah. Your cover of The Flame, uh-huh. uh, you dedicated to your daughter. Uh, it's just gorgeous. And, you know, when I, when I watch you or listen to you, I always expect to laugh, but I don't expect to, you know, get the chills and cry. Uh, well, you know, that's important for me, too. It's being somebody who's been influenced by theater and, and great film. You've got to have that emotional side to your work. Um, I, I always try to, like, step away from being maudlin or going over that fine line of manipulating people with emotion. But I think when it's honest emotion and it's raw and you know how to step in and out of it, I think it's very effective. Sometimes I get a little serious because I don't want to all just be superficial. I'll say to her, listen, baby. I'm not trying to be your best friend. I'm your mama. But I just want you to know that as time goes by and things sometimes get complicated and you feel like you don't want to come to me because you're scared I'm going to yell at you or judge you or be angry, I I won't. I'm always going to be here for you, sweetheart. That said, promise me one thing, that you don't wake up when you're 17 years old and break your mother's heart and run off with some pimply-faced, uncircumcised punk. (laughs) You know, they say in Kabbalah that babies can see their angels until they're three. And I used to sneak in and watch her smiling up at the ceiling, and I would say, Hey, baby, tonight as your angels hover above you, and you know how much your mama loves you And your angels whisper in your ear My little dear And she calls me late one night from some roadside truck stop Mama, he left me here all by myself He threw me out of the car I don't know where I am, Mom, I'm so confused I think he might have put something in my drink I'm standing next to a Cinnabon don't you move, baby. Mama's coming to get you. I will kill the little prick. I race down the highway. I find her standing next to a mobile station. I bring her into the car and wrap her in a pashmina. And I say, baby, never let any man or any woman ever define who you are. You stand on your own two feet and be the beautiful, independent, strong woman that Mama's raised you to be. And I promise I will always... How do you think becoming a mother has changed you? Oh, I think it's just opened me up to, you know, a, a whole different way of looking at the world. And, and when you're kind of there every day in the trenches with your kid, I think it just, it just makes you just a better person, a stronger person. And it's not easy. It's not easy being a good parent. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's always a challenge and, you know, a good one. You have always had a, a, a great love of, of fashion and uh, glamour. Where do you think that comes from? I think from growing up, you know, you know, when I was little and, and growing up in Flint, Michigan, and in the 60s, you know, all the women there were, like, very into, like, high style. And, you know, I always just thought that a well-turned-out woman was, like, you know, very, you know, it was, it was just part of who, who she was and a good reflection of her confidence. And I think that just sort of like started to evolve as I became 
a woman and more, you know, in the world. I just think fashion, when done right, it's just um, another level of your confidence. You've said in the past that you put drag queens on the map back in the 80s, which I appreciate. I can't speak for my my audience, but I definitely appreciate. And uh, you're also a huge advocate of gay rights, LGBT rights, which I, as a a gay person, uh, appreciate. Please. I mean, how could you not be? I mean, how could you not be, you know, a person of the world and somebody who loves great art and, and not be a supporter of people's, you know, full expression uh, emotionally, I mean, it's just it's, it's criminal otherwise. And and I do I do want to clarify because when I say that you're in tune with the culture, I want to add that it's not just American culture, but really all cultures. Um, and this may be a stretch, but do you think that is in part because of your love of fashion, since fashion is international, or are you just naturally just inherently curious about the world? Well, I think it's you know I think all of it plays into the other. I think that. If, if you're interested in other cultures, the fashion is going to play, play into it. You know, the music, the food, the travel, the, you know, the experience of somebody else's point of view. I think it's, this is, these are all things that keep a person balanced and interesting in life. I mean, America is a new country. It's one of the youngest countries. I don't think we necessarily always have the best take on, on the world. And... It's up to us to, like, you know, be open and, and really embrace other cultures. It's not necessarily up to them to embrace us. When I think about your shows, your one-woman shows over the years, they are, in a way, how I measure different eras, different different cycles of time. Uh, and it seems yeah, like thank you. In, in every one of your shows, you're covering a, um, a, a succession of events that is reflective of the times in which we live. I still have my Samsung flip phone, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> If I'm not on the cutting edge of the iPhone app technology. I mean, you know I'm a major Twitterer, though, so that you can always find me on Twitter. And I hate it when I travel because, you know, I don't have the iPhone, so I can't just, I can't just Twitter as I'm walking down the street, walking in front of buses and trucks. And, <laughs> and ignoring you as I, I bump into you. And for, even though I'm communicating with you, I really can't, have no interest in seeing you. Or, get the fuck out of my way, I'm twittering all my fans. Get out of my way, you stupid asshole, fuck you. Oh, you're a human being? You want my attention? What would you say are your favorite and least favorite aspects of of being alive in 2013? Well, I just think being alive anytime is a great thing, because you get to watch the world evolve, and you get to see your own life evolve. I mean... I think one of the, the things that I find the least inspiring about the time we live in is, is social media and the Internet. I feel like it's, it's damaged the people's ability to communicate and be creative. I think that we're, we're people that need to express ourselves and talk. I don't think boiling it down to 140 letters or characters is enough of a, a reach. I think that we have to go beyond ourselves, and I think that social media tends to shrink people's ability to to communicate. So you think it's disconnected us? In many ways, yes, I do. And yet you love Twitter, right? I mean, do I love any of it? I don't know if I love any okay. of it. But I think that it's, it's a necessary part of my work and reaching out to people. But I don't think it's the way I like to communicate, per se. Right, right. I understand that. I feel the same way. Uh, I heard an interview with you recently where you were talking about the the plastic surgery craze and how people used to tell you that if you didn't get your nose done you'd never have a chance in the business and you sort of you know rebelled against that from the beginning you you did not accept that and when i watched you talk about that and i thought about you as a performer and the 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 showbiz brassiness you embody on stage uh i i realized that you really do exude self acceptance both on stage and in person were you always confident in, in some ways, I've always been confident. You know, other ways, I you know wasn't necessarily always uh, 100% thrilled with my looks. You know, we all want to look like the girl next door, the, the, the beautiful, traditional, you know, waspy girl. There's something about that that's very uh, easy. But as my life has gone on and I've traveled and met people and seen how people evolve, I think that my looks are definitely part of 
what I feel good about. You know, it's given me um, the ability to be compassionate, to not look at people and just say, oh, just just be dismissive. I think that we all need to be open to each other and and have that kind of love and emotion. So just a few more questions before we wrap things up, because I know you have to go. Uh, I I asked our listeners to send in some questions for you. Um, The first one was, uh, can I be you? So we can sort of skip over that one, because I know the answer is no. Ask her what she thought of her role in The King of Comedy, an absolutely remarkable piece of work. Well, you know, it's probably uh, because I haven't had as many great movie roles as I would like. Um, It was my first role and my biggest and most impressive role so of course to this day I still love it um, and it's it's a great film matter of fact it's closing the um, Tribeca Film Festival the restored version of it so it, ha- it, it was a very prescient film ahead of its time and it talked a lot about fame and the price people pay for it and you know of course who knew that it would come to pass to be such a you know big part of our culture people wanting to be famous for absolutely no reason so I love my work in it, and it was a great experience. And finally, do you still talk to Roseanne? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, sometimes we only, we only tweet with each other because she's uh, either in Hawaii or right now I know she's in Las Vegas doing an extended run at the uh, Tropicana. But we're still in touch, and I've seen her in Hawaii a few times when we have been on vacation over there. And um, I'm actually close to some of her kids as well, and um, we remain great friends. And weren't you on one of uh, the ep- one of the episodes of her new show? Of um, Roseanne's Nuts. Actually, it was with um, Phyllis Diller. Right. We had a great time. She was a great lady. What was it like spending time with her and getting to know her? Unbelievable. She was just one of the, the grooviest, hippest, to the last day of her life, most you know fabulous people in the world. Real deal, brilliant, never lost her edge. Well... We can all say the same about you, Sandra. We're so psyched to have you. Thank you, honey. Um, it's always great to be able to keep doing it, having an audience. I love my audience. I, I admire people that, you know, that go out and see live performing because, you know, sometimes you just don't want to do it. You're not necessarily motivated. But really, live performing is probably the most important thing we have in this world because it's, it's a real... It's a continuum, and to get to know people through their work is amazing. I couldn't agree more. Do you have any connection to Long Island? Have you performed here before? Um, You know, I've I've performed all over Long Island, and and my uncle, for years, uh, was a doctor in Merrick, Long Island. Do you ever come to the Hamptons? Of course I do, every summer. Lessons learned. Number one, it's Sandra, not Sandra, unless you're Madonna. Number two... Just because someone uses social media doesn't necessarily mean that they love it. While Sandra is known for being edgy and in tune with what's in style, she doesn't blindly accept the most popular mode of communication. Number three, Sandra Bernhardt's preferred form of communication is the one-woman show. Although she started out in stand-up, her performance style was shaped by a love of theater, and she began developing one-woman shows where the objective was bigger than just getting laughs. She said in an interview with The Rumpus, My desire was to engage the audience, to get their rapt attention, and to also pose ideas and concepts about feminism, about sexuality, about pop culture, about music, that forced them to remain engaged for up to two hours and not fade away. And finally, number four. Although she later admitted pretending to have an affair with Madonna to create a media frenzy, I wonder why I didn't ask about the relationship, what it was then, what it is now. They seem like such obvious questions. But what the hell? Hindsight 2020. You live, you learn. Sandra, thank you so much for joining us today. Great interview. My pleasure. Looking forward to seeing everybody. Okay, take care. Thanks again. Bye, honey. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Interview with the Artist comes to you from WBAZ Radio. I'm Walker Vreeland. Leave your comments and listen to past episodes on our website, interviewwiththeartist.com. Thanks for listening.